What happened in Japan and is it safe back to be in markets? Buffett sells half of his Apple stake, Anglo Gold Ashanti and Nedbank results and Ethereum ETFs. Hello and welcome to JC Direct episode 59848 August. I got it wrong last month, last week. I said it was September. Sometimes dates are hard. My name is Simon Brown, and this podcast is brought to you by Just One Lap. So let's start off with the Apple story, because this kind of feeds into maybe the Japan story at the same time and what we saw happen two degree on Friday and then absolutely on Monday. So the the let, let's all go all the way actually back to Apple results. They had some results out uh, Friday, and truthfully, they weren't particularly terrible by any stretch of imagination. I mean, we've got iPhone sales, and they are flat, you know, 1% year-on-year growth. I mean, still 39-odd billion in terms of revenue. Uh, MacBooks, uh, Air Pros, and iMacs, they were up 2%. iPads, 24% year-on-year, year. actually puts them ahead of the, of the MacBook uh, segment. Now, th- the reason for iPads is they had new iPads. What they are finding is that 60% of iPad buyers are first-time iPad buyers. I mean, I've got one here. I don't know. I mean, I've owned three. My first was an iPad 2, I think. So, what, that takes us back 14-odd years when they lost. My screen's cracked, but it was a small little crack. But anyway, so iPads up 24%, the watch, AirPods, wearables, etc., up 2%. That's all nice. $61 billion in revenue, up 2%. Uh, services. Services up 14%. And that's the real deal. Although, there's a caveat in here. So Microsoft, sorry, uh, Alphabet just lost a case uh, against the Department of Justice, uh, a competition com- a case in the U.S. And part of the trick is, and I'm not going into the nuances of it's complex and the like, but part of it is that uh, Apple receives about $10 billion a year from uh, Alphabet to have Google as the default search in Safari and their phones and stuff. So that's five billion a quarter. It goes into services, but that still leaves twenty odd billion. Uh, if we take that all the way through, net profit ends up being twenty one odd billion, which was only marginally higher, but at a twenty five percent margin, which is nice and chunky. The short answer is. Your things such as MacBooks, iPads, watches, AirPods, and all of those, they do fine. They bumble along. Uh, you know, I've got a MacBook Pro. I replace it every three years because it's a business product and I can write it down, uh, depreciate it over the time. But mostly, you could keep it a lot, lot longer than that. iPhones, they used to be a once or twice a year replacement. Now they're on to three or four years. They're slipping in China. That's not massively surprising. The Chinese Communist Party's cracked down and said if you work for the Chinese Communist Party, you can't have an iPhone. They don't think it is secure. All in all, results were okay. Services looking good and in time will become the biggest part of this business. But a bit of time to go. The news came out late on, uh, when was it? Late on Friday, I think after the close on Friday in the U.S., that uh, Warren Buffett had cut his stake, or Berkshire Hathaway, in Apple in half. Now, let's be clear, a couple of things. Firstly, uh, that means that Apple is now 20% of the Berkshire Hathaway net asset value portfolio. So it was 40. Maybe he was just taking some money off the table. Uh, This is a stock that has, I mean, this is the 10-year chart, weekly. In in, in a decade, it's gone from, call it $20 to $200. It's a 10-bagger in a decade. But there's a bunch else I want to have a look at here. The first is the PE. And, I mean, there's there's broadly, uh, come on, PE, talk to me. There's broadly... I mean, there's no polite way of saying this. This is an expensive-looking PE. Currently on a 31 PE, if we take this over a 10-year period, it's been more expensive back in 2021. And then we had the NASDAQ, the, 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 the bear market, rather. But it's not a cheap stock, and I think that's what we've got to keep in mind. I mean, it's PE, forward PE is 29, 10-year mean is 24 and a half. Price to book has gone completely crazy. Here's one thing I love about Apple. Their dividend yield is half a percent. It's terrible, but shares are outstanding. A decade ago, call it 24 billion, call it now 15 billion shares. They buy back shares aggressively. They absolutely do. The point being is 
why did Buffett cut? Did he cut because he's panicking and he wants to go into cash because he thinks that global markets are collapsing? Maybe. But that's not Buffett's style. That's too much trying to time the market. I think more, it's probably just a case of him saying, you know what, this is not a cheap stock. We've made a massive uh, a profit here. Let's head for the hills. The, the consensus remains a buy. We've got 24 buys, seven strong buys, 12 holds, and two strong sells. Mm, that's ballsy. Uh, average target price, $234. Apple is 208 The high is 300 The low is 180 It does actually occasionally hit those low target prices. You can see it there in 21 You can see it there again in 23 So maybe it gets down to around 180 i got to say, at that price, is it cheap? No, it's cheaper, but it's still Apple, and they still have a truckload of cash. Uh, so, I mean, I th I, I, I'm I not reading a heck lot into Warren Buffett. Someone on Twitter called it the trade of the century. Uh, I'm deeply skeptical about that sort of story. But certainly he cut his stake. Uh, he's cut it down. So he now has uh, Berkshire Hathaway about $250 billion in cash. And he could buy... Tons with that. I mean, I, I, I don't know what he could buy, but I mean, he could buy, I mean, probably, uh, uh, he could probably buy Disney and a whole bunch else and then still have some cash left over for, I don't know, doing what else you want to do uh, with all of that money. Uh, we've got an event in two weeks' time, 22nd of August, with Mishima Gama, Learn Charting with Mishima Gama. I've told the story. I did the uh, Learn How to uh, Trading as a Side Hustle back in June, but I didn't touch much on technical analysis. Mishima is the expert here. This is a 5.30 event. You can attend in person uh, in Rosebank, the Standard Bank Head Office in Rosebank, Johannesburg, or webcast, just one lap.com slash events for more information and booking. So then, and I started with Apple because there's some views, some theories that uh, Apple is, is, is you know, and, and Buffett selling, this was the problem. This is what started the, 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 the panic selling and everything else. I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm not massively convinced by that at all. But on Friday morning when I did my show, I noticed Japan down 6%. Like, what the heck is happening here? And then I, you know, dug a little bit further, and I couldn't quite put my finger on what was happening. On Monday, we had Japan down what another ten plus percent. In all, it was down about twenty five percent from the highs. The highs were eleven July, so less than a month. Japan has collapsed humongously. There's just no other way to put it. And then the theories start coming out as to why. What, what is the story? What has spooked markets? Why has Japan suddenly uh, fallen off? And the, 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 the sell-off was marked. Uh, let me pull up the screen here. So there is the Nikkei 225. So in fact, it went a little bit lower ultimately. Uh, if we pull that down to there and we take that actually to the highs. So it was down almost 27% high to low from, and as I said, that high was less than a month ago. So this has not just you know happened in the last minute. Since then, we have had a massively significant rebound. The lows was around 31,000. It's now rebounded to around 35,000. The highs were 42,000 and change. There's been a couple of reasons behind it. So we need to step back to Wednesday last week. I spoke about it on Thursday. Jerome Powell basically said rate cuts are on the table for uh, uh, September uh, 18th, which is their next meeting. And I said he wanted to look at data. He wanted to see inflation keep on moving the right way, i.e. lower. And he wouldn't mind a little tick up in jobs data. And Friday's jobs data, well, unemployment was 4.3%. Previous and expected was 4.1%. Non-farm payrolls came in a bit weak, and there were revisions downwards for the previous non-farm payrolls at the same time. So suddenly, jobs is looking fairly ugly. We also get a trigger of the SHAM rule, if I'm spelling that correctly. SHAM, S-A-H-M, is the, is the spelling of it. So if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And the point with the SHAM rule, and this lady used to work for the Federal Reserve, she no longer does, I'm not going to go into the nuances. You can go and look at it. But pretty much the Sham rule says when unemployment triggers and goes half a percent above the three-month low average or something like that, uh, there's been a recession every single time. Okay. And you can go check the data. 
There absolutely has. And guess what the Sham rule did on Friday? Well, it hit 0.5. It actually hit 0.49, and then there's tons of roundings. Do we round that to 0.5? I don't know. It spooked markets because according to this rule, we are heading, well, the U.S. is heading into a recession. So we've got to start, the U.S. has got to start cutting rates aggressively. Uh, we've suddenly got a recession on the cards. We're seeing a tech sell-off. And woe is woe, Warren Buffett sold his Apple shares. Man, the world is ending. And what we then started to see was a spike on VIX. So this is a, th uh, no, this is a 30-year chart on VIX going all the way back to 1990. And VIX, and you can barely see the line over there, but it goes up to 65-ish, which makes it the third biggest spike in 30 years of VIX. The only bigger ones are 2008 and then 2020. Global financial crisis and pandemic. So something is happening here, particularly in the options market. The general consensus was this was the Japanese carry trade unwinding. So what is the carry trade? Uh, the carry trade is the idea that you would borrow, you would take money, uh, you, sorry, you would borrow money in, in, in Japan uh, at zero or in many cases negative interest rates, but let's say zero. You would buy, borrow money in Japan uh, at zero. You would take it across to the US and put it into treasury bills at one or two percent. You would bring it into South Africa and put it into government bonds at 10 percent. You put a hedge on for the currency risk and you are golden. Suddenly you're making money and it's risk-free, except nothing's risk-free. So the problem comes in, Japan upgrades uh, earlier in the year for the first time since forever and a day uh, and no longer has negative rates. That was absolutely a biggie. Now the U.S. is going to start cutting rates, so that trade starts to get squeezed. So people need to unwind it, which means they need to be uh, uh, selling some assets, uh, get, repaying the loans, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But why the big collapse? Why the collapse in the Nikkei? And I tell you what I suspect the collapse in the Nikkei, because certainly the carry trade didn't help in this scenario. And there's a lot that we can go into around options and where volatility fits in and the gamma and delta trades and the like. And certainly that sort of heightened the VIX move. But I don't think we can just blame the, the, the carry trade. I think there's more to it. And I think part of what there's more to it is, is that the J Japanese trade has become immensely crowded, right? Everyone, myself included, has been talking about Japan. The stock market hit its highest level since 1989, uh, was it 88, but like a 30-plus a, a year all-time high. It's been a long trip. Everyone's been talking about Japan. Buffett has a big stake in Japan, although he was cunning. He sold bonds in Japan, which he basically pays zero uh, coupon on, maybe half a percent or something, and used that money to buy the assets and the cash flows will pay back the bonds. Buffett's a smart chap. But there's low liquidity in the Japanese market, relative to global markets, not relative to the JSC. So suddenly what you've got is people are starting to worry about recession. They're starting to worry uh, about U.S. rates coming down. They're starting to worry a whole bunch of things, and they think, hmm, and the Japanese market has already fallen some 5 or 10% off the highs, and suddenly people want out. And that's a very small door to exit because of the lack of liquidity. And hence we see this massive collapse in Japanese equities. I think Monday was the worst day in the history of Japan in terms of, of points and percentages for a single day. It was a horror story. Where to next? I think Chantal Marx on my show on Tuesday called it a flash crash. And I think she's kind of right. I think that very much sums it up. I think I think the, the, the worry is now over. I mean, the, the, the worries around interest rates and recessions and unemployment and all of that is still there. But I think the concern that this was going to turn into a global meltdown is suddenly gone. Looking at markets generally, we're seeing a pullback. Absolutely, we are. But it is frankly looking like a good old-fashioned healthy pullback within a stronger uh, a bull market. This, to me, and I've said it before, isn't looking like a early days of a bear market. Now, let's be very clear. I could be wrong. Been wrong before, I'll be wrong again. 
Absolutely. But this isn't looking like the end of the world. It isn't looking like Japan is going to take the entire world down with it. I think it was a combination of events. And one of the things, for example, Bitcoin got slaughtered. On Monday morning, it was sub 50,000. Let's be clear what Bitcoin really is. It's a short on the, on the VIX and a geared long on, on, on global equity. That's all it is. So Shorten the VIX, get long in global equity. Those two went the other way. And when people want money, Bitcoin's 24-7. So what do they do? They sell their Bitcoins. Hence, Bitcoin under 50,000. It's back around 56, 57. So that's all going fine. So I got to say, I think that the Japan story is behind us. I'm agreeing with Chantal Marx that that was probably a flash crash. Uh, And yes, valuations in some of the tech spaces are stretched. We are seeing some rotation, not just into the mid-cap space and the small-cap space in the U.S. We're just broadly seeing some rotation out of those big tech names. Will they have their day in the sun again? I don't know. I mean, we shall see. I mean, I do know. They will have their day in the sun Will it just be anytime soon or is it going to be, I don't know, ages until we manage to get another day in the sun? But we'll leave that there for Japan. Uh, Let's head over to some results that have been coming through. We had NetBank results on Tuesday. And I got to say, I thought that they weren't a bad set of numbers. There were some things I didn't love about them. There were some things that I thought were perhaps better than others. And if 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 I look at the highlights, um, HEPs up 11%, not bad. Uh, ROE almost 15, getting back. Uh, impairments at 1.04 versus 1.21%. That was a good number. I, I got to say, I was surprised that impairments came down and down so much. Uh, cost to income, which is a number I always look at, 55.3. Previous was 52.9. All in all, a good set of numbers from, from, from Nedbank. Yes, the, the, the cost to income is a, is a concern, but we've been in a high inflation environment. There are higher compliance costs. Nedbank is still trading about 50 bucks below those all-time highs. But we spoke a while ago. It must have been, ah, this was a GNU break. Was it a GNU break? No, it even, yeah, yeah, it was a GNU break. You can see that line there, uh, sort of resistance was around the 240 level. It's broken it quite nicely. Banks generally remain uh, quite strong. This is the banking index, if it would be so kind for me. Uh, The banking index, you can see that nice break there. Uh, And banking index is of itself now trading back at all-time highs. So really good results from Nedbank. And then Anglo Gold Ashanti, which I hold. You've got to have some gold miners in this market, uh, absolutely. And you've got to have just some gold. I will hold some GLD at the same time. Um, but the Anglo numbers were really good. They are producing. They've got all in sustained costs of around, if memory says, around 1600 So they're making about $800 per, per, per ounce. And, and it's not just Nedbank. I think we had Harmony out earlier today as well. The short answer is, is that results are coming in good, for the gold miners. And they will continue as long as gold stays where it currently is. We had Mishima Gama on Insider Exchange with Jimmy Moyaha last week, and she says target is 2,680 in the sort of short term, maybe by the end of the year, 2,680. We will, of course, see some pullbacks. I mean, that's just bog standard for the course. Pullbacks are not to be unexpected, but it stayed within that, that sort of range. Let me call up a gold price here. Uh, You can see quite clearly, and let me move that to a weekly because that's how we should be looking at charts. You can see that that box that's essentially sitting there, the triangle. It's broken up, made highs. It's come back into it. It might even go back to the bottom of it, which is around 2290. But as long as it stays in that box, gold's trend is still nice and mighty. If it breaks that 2170 and if it breaks that uh, 2060 are sort of your next target. But gold is doing perfectly well and you want to be holding some gold. All those worries, etc. on Monday and there was gold sitting at all-time highs above 2005. And it it helps uh, the portfolio make no mistake. Uh, We've also got, interestingly, the U.S. If you remember at the beginning of the year, the U.S. approved uh, ETFs, SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, approved ETFs on Bitcoin. 
and they've now approved ETFs on Ethereum. So there are eight of them that have come to market. We've got a list of all of them, just one lap.com slash ETFs. They're, of course, not trading on the JC. They trade in New York. You've got to find a New York broker who can trade them for you. Ethereum's interesting. Firstly, its, its blockchain is proof of stake rather than proof of work. So it's a green uh, crypto, and they did the transition from proof of work to proof of stake, and that went perfectly smooth. And secondly, the actual blockchain itself is used for tons of things. I mean, NFTs were all embedded into it now. NFTs have completely collapsed into nothing, but Ethereum's an interesting one. I don't hold it. I just hold some good old-fashioned Bitcoin. I keep it nice and simple. I don't need to be too fancy in that regard. Uh, but we will park that there for now. JC is a registered trademark of the JC Limited. JC Direct is an independent broadcast and is not endorsed or affiliated with, nor has it been authorized or otherwise approved by JC Limited. The views expressed in this program are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of JC Limited. That came louder than I thought. Uh, so my name is Simon. We'll be back again next week. Uh, a very advanced heads up. First week of September. I'm at the beach. There won't be a show. But my name is Simon. Look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all. Cheers all.